I would like now to open the first plenary session um, of today that will be uh, moderated by uh, Mrs. Apostolia Karamali, uh, who is uh, head of unit uh, RNI actors at the European Commission. And the session is entitled uh, Meeting Stakeholder Needs, Objective for Stakeholder Engagement, Views from the Research Infrastructures and the ERA Stakeholders. The, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I would like to start with one statement. Uh, one image is worth more than a thousand words. I think that this democratic representation of stakeholders in this panel uh, passes a very clear message that we really want to put stakeholders at the fore today. And I thank you very much for taking the time to actually engage with us today to discuss uh, and see how we can um, better improve the involvement of stakeholders, uh, both in ESFRI and in the work of research infrastructures. So we had a very um, inspiring and ambitious political opening by the presidency, the ESFRI chair, the commission, and also chaired by Carlo, with all his wisdom and experience in research infrastructures. And now the purpose of this first uh, plenary session is actually to focus, um, as was introduced, by, on the needs, to focus on the needs. Um, why do we need to have uh, stakeholder um, involvement in ESFRI and for research infrastructures? What is the purpose? What is the objective? This session will then be um, complemented with other discussions, uh, especially in plenary two, where, sorry, in the parallel sessions where we will address the same questions but from a thematic sector perspective. And finally, we will conclude with the plenary session chaired by David Bommert on the how, which methodology, which best practices we can actually be inspired from and then use them to actually improve the stakeholder engagement. In other words, the full day is about being quite concrete on why, how, we can engage with stakeholders um, and research infrastructures and as free more broadly. Um, there is a clear message, there is a clear political opening, this is needed, there is a new way uh, in the way we uh, manage ERA now in order to involve everybody around the table. At the same time, there is so much experience in research infrastructures and we want to be actually the first in class and come with concrete examples and translating this into concrete deliverables and how we can actually actually um, be better by, uh, through this uh, new uh, way of managing uh, things. And I know that many things, many things happen already across the territory in the EU internationally, but the question is to how to learn about these best practices and how to expand and spread and have a more systemic approach at European level in order to uh, increase the impact and the return on investment, of course. So this is the spirit of the discussion. Um, we have um, important uh, representatives, hopefully for most of the stakeholder categories here, and also you will have the opportunity later on in the discussion to also express your views. So we are joined here by uh, Paco Colomer in his capacity as uh, chair of the ERIC Forum. Uh, Andrew Harrison with many hats, but today as uh, the, the chair of ERF. Uh, Antoine Petit, um, again with his, in his capacity as chair of the G6, uh, from representing the, the biggest research organizations, then Muriel Atane, uh, Secretary General of EARTO, David Bommert, Secretary General from CESAR, and also uh, Benjamin Martinez Sanchez, uh, representing the Coimbra Group uh, of Universities. So as you can see, we have representatives both from the research infrastructures themselves, um, research organizations, universities, industry, so hopefully we have a good mix and we'll have the opportunity to learn and interact and uh, hopefully have a, a stimulating discussion. So without further ado, we'd like to um, invite uh, our panelists to make some introductory statement explaining where they come from and their views about uh, the objectives and, and the needs for stakeholder engagement. So starting with Paco. Paco, please. Good morning. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, S3, uh, for, uh, for this stakeholders forum. Thank you, S3, for this opportunity to talk. Thank you, Lia. Uh, so, <clears throat> I'm representing the ERIC Forum. 
Uh, ERICS are the European Research Infrastructure Consortia. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> a obviously very successful form of uh, organizing a research infrastructure. There are already 24 ERICS that exist in Europe in, four, uh, in five clusters that are those of S3. Uh, and uh, as a bottom-up uh, <clears throat> initiative some years ago, it was decided that there was uh, sufficient uh, challenges and, and uh, needs in common to create a forum uh, in which the, all the ERICs will be represented and we would be working together uh, in order to help in those challenges. So the forum was established. Uh, uh, I am very happy to say that all the ERICs in existence are part of the forum. Therefore, it is actually a very nice body uh, for, uh, to, to represent these infrastructures uh, in this stakeholder uh, uh, or being a stakeholder uh, of S3. One of the good things uh, of the ERICs, <clears throat> as I say, in all these different areas of research is that uh, we share a lot of the stakeholders that S3 has. So there is a lot of, uh, of uh, common uh, the, um, opportunity, but also common challenge in explaining <coughs> what, are, uh, what is the best way uh, to answer the, the challenges that we have uh, uh, as research infrastructures. So the ERICs talk to the governments, which are actually, as Carlo remembered this morning, the actual owners eh, of, the, of the research infrastructures. The ERICs uh, talk, and even better, talk through the forum to the European Commission. And there is a very nice uh, and, and productive dialogue there. But it also, as operators of the infrastructures themselves, uh, the ERICs talk to the users, eh, the use to the research communities. And I think that is how we can better understand what are the services that have been mentioned this morning, the services that we as uh, research infrastructures uh, are being demanded eh, by these users. And, uh, well, I, I was uh, mentioning uh, Jana, uh, she talked about the comfort zone this morning. I, I, have not, I don't remember where I was last time in my comfort zone because this is really all the time. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, of course, what we mean is that the current services uh, uh, are always challenged by the new needs. Uh, we always are thinking which are the new services. So since I only have a few minutes, I want to mention some of the, of the uh, challenges and, and some of the, of the roles that we as ERICs have, because they have to be worked together with many of you, eh? with many of the, of the other stakeholders uh, uh, in S3. So one is the need of awareness and recognition of the ERICs by the member states. There is uh, still quite a lot of uh, work to do by which uh, the ERICs are uh, visible, are uh, understood and are uh, supported. And then, of course, they're recognized eh, to all its legal level so that uh, the ERICs can actually operate uh, as they are uh, expected. Then there is... Uh, we, we discuss often uh, that S3, of course, as a strategic forum, uh, looks forward uh, into which are the infrastructures that are needed, eh? uh, possibly in the future. But there is also a very important option that it is to enhance and upgrade existing infrastructures. And that is something that, of course, who, who better eh, than the infrastructures themselves can help in identifying this challenge. So, uh, well, uh, we talk about uh, uh, collaboration between different uh, different, uh, let's say, cross-domain, uh, uh, because uh, th there is a challenge. It, well, it was mentioned this morning. Uh, the, the social sciences do not know where to sit eh, in the panels later, because they are everywhere, right? And this is happening a lot in many other aspects in our infrastructures, that there are synergies between communities. And a place like the Forum is a fantastic place to, to see that. And then, uh, well, I would, I would I have, a, a, of course, a long list, uh, but uh, one of the things that makes the, uh, the ERICs very attractive is the, the VAT exception that is actually offered eh, to the infrastructures when the countries get together to create that. And that is uh, something that works in general, but there are still some areas uh, that the, the member states themselves could help 
for example, in recognizing VAT exemption, also for the notes of the infrastructure or for in-kind contributions and other areas that are not completely covered. The list is so long. Actually, it is a beautiful list that Carlo Rizzuto put in his, in his uh, well, in, in, the, in the report of the expert group on ERICS just uh, a few months ago. But uh, I would like to just conclude saying that, well, we have a, a real opportunity to uh, participate in this dialogue from the perspective of the operators themselves, from the oper uh, perspective of the research infrastructures, and this, uh, this vision is, to, is an added value to the, uh, to the discussions that happen directly as, at S3. Thank you. Thank you, Paco. So now, Andrew, we have to share this. That's fine. Thank, thank you, Leo. It's great to see everyone here being reunited face to face with old friends. As Leah said, uh, I'm here today with my ERF hat on. Um, ERF is an organization of nationally funded research infrastructures, open to all across Europe, but primarily rooted in what you might call the more traditional physical infrastructure, synchrotrons, neutron sources. But all of these open on, on excellence basis to in a pan-European fashion. Um, I'm also a director of a, a research facility, and I'm about to move to the place I, I understand should be called Ellie in the future, so, uh, and I'll come back to Ellie uh, shortly. Um, I thought it'd be useful just to track the trajectory of where research infrastructures have come from and where it's going to, and Daniel Veselkum indicated that you know, this trajectory is not over, we haven't come to a rest, uh, and I think that points in interesting new directions. Um, I was going to start saying, you know, at year one, we had these large... Uh, largely fundamentally based research infrastructures like so. Carla reminded us, of course, the story should start hundreds of years before then, but if we take the start of the modern era as being beginning with uh, research infrastructures that were funded to support fundamental science for experts, the, re the research was initially done all in-house. That model broadened to then uh, accept users from uh, from outside, primarily from universities, but then increasingly from industry. And then those users themselves evolved. They went from being almost all experts to increasingly non-experts over a diverse range of, of domains. And with that came new challenges. And, and, and you could ask the question, how did that come about? Well, in the early days, it was largely by an ad hoc osmotic process, brokered largely actually through the universities. Colleagues would speak to each other in universities and, and say, do you know, we've done some amazing research at this, this institute. Maybe there are some, there's some use for you in this other different area of science. Um, as the years have progressed, that ad hoc uh, process has evolved and has become much more directed. So the process of making research infrastructures more diverse, more relevant to a wider range of users, increasingly not expert, has been supported by initiatives largely from the RIs, and the RIs are also great at brokering a lot of this. They start to increasingly provide fora um, through which thousands and thousands of research researchers pass. My research infrastructure alone has about 10,000 users visits a year. So the RIs themselves are remarkable fora for uh, enhancing these exchanges and broadening the applicability. But still, uh, in that sense, within a, a more or less defined domain within the scope of the research infrastructure. If we carry on that trajectory and imagine what we might do to engage more widely, um, then, then I think we need to, to, to think more broadly again. So at the moment, some of the areas of development involve bringing together research, bringing together RIs across different platforms now. So increasingly what we're seeing is more complex problems, and this is a well-established model in the life sciences, it's becoming more established in the physical sciences, is to solve more complex problems, you need to bring together larger teams of researchers and draw on, on, on a greater number of research infrastructures. So coordination across platforms is becoming increasingly important. And actually, a, a case in point here, a really nice example of where that's done well, is, is, the, is, the, is the ERIC that uh, Carlo and then Jana first led, CERIC which actually um, uh, uh, supports directed actions to encourage and stimulate and support access and effective delivery of science across multiple research platforms. Um, but again, that's largely within the context of, let's say, physical infrastructures. And we touched earlier on about the challenge of broadening that yet more. So you know, really to address societal problems, we need to draw on a, a much wider domain of researchers and potential research infrastructures. So it's all very well to come up with a new vaccine for COVID, but if you were to implement it effectively, you need to understand how populations respond to it. You need to understand the social sciences. So to really reach out and tackle these much bigger, high-level 
uh, societal problems, we need to think of ways of integrating across quite different types of RIs and researchers. And that, for us, I think, is where we see the role of Esprit, among other things, as a broker, as a forum, to bring together representatives from the RIs, uh, from the research communities, and that research is done primarily in universities and, and in industry, uh, and also making sure that connects uh, with, with the policymakers and the funders. And in that respect, I think S3 is, is remarkable. And just, just to finish for the moment, um, uh, or could provide remarkable opportunities, um, I've also been privileged to, to sit on S3. I was allowed to sit at the table whilst the UK was allowed in, in the room. Uh, one day, I hope we're back. Um, but, but in that forum, um, I, as a, as a, as a RI uh, worker, was exposed to a much broader range of strategic considerations. Uh, and I also found another formative uh, influence being sitting on the Finnish research uh, uh, um, council's way of assessing research infrastructures, where you'd sit around a room and you'd compare a telescope with, uh, with a medical data bank, uh, or social sciences data banks and so forth. And again, I think fora that bring together people from very, very different walks of life and from very different types of research is absolutely essential to, to trying to tackle these big societal problems together. Yes, we have to share microphones and uh, share. So Antoine, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizer uh, for inviting the G6. Uh, so probably you don't know or you don't all know what is G6. Uh, in fact, G6 is an informal uh, network of six uh, major research uh, performing organizations in Europe. CNR in Italy, CSIC in Spain, Helmholtz Association, Leibniz Association, and Max Planck Society in Germany, and CNRS. Uh, of which I have the pleasure and the honor to be the CEO in, in France. And so we, we really lead, uh, I think, the, the way in Europe in terms of basic and interdisciplinary re research. And we represent uh, something like 135,000 staffs uh, in Europe. And clearly our organizations are deeply committed in research excellence and it is closely related that it has been already said, to world-class uh, pan-European infrastructures. Each of uh, our uh, in institutions is involved in tens of uh, research infrastructures, uh, and uh, we, we really consider it as crucial uh, for, for Europe. Uh, it's crucial because it's uh, clearly uh, the, these infrastructures are key to, to enable cutting-edge research and to address also the, the pressing challenges of our, our society. But these infrastructure are also key to develop uh, economic uh, or close relations with the economic world and to address uh, global uh, challenges. They are also key for us because they, they are the, a very important way to foster scientific cooperations. And uh, last but not least, uh, they are key to attract international talents and to uh, stabilize research intensive regions in Europe. And clearly for us, research infrastructure are the pillars of our activities. And we play a crucial role in developing the, these infrastructures with other, of course, but if I may, more than most. We are indeed not only users of these infrastructures, but we are also strongly involved in supporting and running these infrastructures. And as we all know, if an infrastructure is first an investment expense, it's also, it requires also annual operating and maintenance expenses. And these different expenses are often the responsibility of different actors, of course, at the European, but also at the national levels. And substantial amounts of the national budget of the G6 members are dedicated to uh, area uh, research and production operations for the benefit of the, the global community. And so we, we also employ thousands of, uh, of, uh, of people that are involved in operating single site or 
distributed uh, research infrastructure. And so therefore, dialogue and exchanges between all the actors are essential. And that's why uh, JSIC institutions appreciate the, the work of uh, ESFRI and the process towards the European uh, roadmap of research infrastructures. Today, we must all work together to address the challenge, more or less new, that lie ahead. And I would like to highlight four of them. The first one, which is uh, from the beginning of the day, perhaps the elephant of the room in the room, is the cost of energy. We are really worried about the rise in energy costs, but also of raw material costs. We re recently learned that the CERN is considering to literally stop some experiments to save energy. Another e example is given by the French Synchrotron Soleil, and the director is there, you can be confirmed. And uh, probably the, the, the expenses for electricity will be multiplied by five. Five. Okay. That's huge. And I think none of us has right now the budget to, to cover these uh, new expenses. The second challenge I would like to point is the, the need of, uh, to rationalize the research infrastructure and landscape. As it has been said, we need infrastructure now in all sciences, including, of course, uh, social sciences and humanities. But we were convinced that the, the landscape, uh, very, very important landscape, uh, analy landscape analysis that has been done by, by S3 should be paralyzed by a sustainability uh, landscape there is indeed a limit to the involvement of, uh, of RI in RIs, and we, we should measure uh, cost and benefits. Uh, with the we should assess these costs and benefits very regularly to ensure that these infrastructures fulfill their primary duty to respond to user demand. And I think that suggestions to rationalize the area landscapes will be fully appreciated. And since at JSIX member, we will face difficulty to, to commit to additional reforms and infrastructure, which is, uh, of course, very dependent of our annual uh, fundings. And I have to say that in, in this regard, we were very surprised and by disappointed by the Council's proposal to reduce the budget of the area parts in 2023 by almost 8.5%. We really convinced that it is absolutely in contradiction with the, the, the cost of energy that I mentioned, but it's also in contradiction. It goes in the wrong direction if we consider the importance of uh, air eyes for, for European research. The third point that I would like to, to, to mention is the question related to internationalization of infrastructures. As I already said, these infrastructures are absolutely to attract people. And it's very important, we, we often speak of the brain drain, it's very important to attract people in the research centers in Europe from all over the world, and we are convinced that infrastructures play a, a very important role. We have also a subject uh, with, with Russia, clearly. Uh, we clearly, all the G6 members, condemn uh, very vigorously the Russian aggression Nevertheless, we have to, to, to clearly see that the loss of expertise from our Russian colleagues, but also the absence or delay in contributions in equipment and instruments from Russia will have a major impact on research infrastructures. And to the, I don't want that my word or misinterpreted. We, we stopped in the CNRS all scientific relations with Russia, and we will not change this if he, except there is a big change. But nevertheless, this uh, raises uh, big questions. And we have also a question with China from our point of view. Should Europe almost systematically position itself as a competitor of China? Or, in the contrary, should we seek cooperation agreements on a few ambitious, uh, very ambitious projects? And last but not least, the fourth challenge I would like to point is the environmental uh, impact. But I will not go into detail because uh, it is uh, uh, even a national point which will be specifically uh, addressed later. 
And I think that these four challenges illustrate the fact that we should anticipate, quantify, and model risk. Recent events like pandemic, conflicts, natural hazard have shown to what extent this issue needs to be better addressed. And they can only be tackled effectively by working together, which is why meetings like uh, the one today are essential. And so thank you again for inviting the G6 to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we proceed with uh, Magnus Fredriksson from Alpha Laval. Uh, I think, I apologize, I think I forgot to introduce you before. We're very thankful to also have industry with us today, and I think we can bring uh, quite interesting perspectives to this uh, discussion. Magnus. So, does it work? Yep. Uh, we'll start with uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Really interesting to. <laughs> <laughs> now, yes. as you can see, when you are coming from the industry, you are not really accepted. So, thank you for. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Um, we are really excited to be here. I'm Magnus Fredriksson, and uh, I'm a program manager at Alfa Laval. Uh, I'm working on strategic research using uh, large-scale research infrastructures. So uh, the work here is mainly aimed to uh, synchrotrons and uh, neutron facilities. But uh, yeah, Alfa Laval, we are an industry company from, global industry company from Sweden, and we uh, provide and develop, manufacture products and services for process industry. And the process industry is uh, a broad uh, name, so uh, we, you can see our products almost everywhere. But we are board leading in uh, heat transfer, uh, separation and fluid handling, and this is the We've been doing this for 130 years, approximately, and we are doing well. But now we can see that we have new business opportunities, and we take some responsibility in the green energy transition. And now we are working on focusing on uh, green hydrogen solutions, uh, fuel cells, uh, energy storage, and a couple of other business areas. But when we go into this field of new challenges, we understand that we need to have the best tools in order to succeed. And uh, thankfully, we have a really uh, interested president and CEO at Alfa Laval. So he's re really curious about exploring if you can use those facilities in our product development. So this is where my uh, uh, journey started in a collaboration with Max4 in Lund, the synchrotron. It's a really prominent uh, facility, but uh, when we were, when I was coming inside the doors, working with the guys there, we can see that their challenges was that they couldn't really get uh, industry engaged. Some industries were present, but some industries they didn't, they didn't have a clue how to use a synchrotron or the, the possibilities. So uh, as a um, researcher in my background, I started to do some uh, root cause analysis and ending, ending up being visiting a lot of other facilities in Europe, uh, most, uh, a lot of prominent ones. Uh, and. Uh, I can see that all infrastructures have the same challenge. So that was a little bit interesting for me. And uh, then I tried to understand, and we worked hard to really find the root cause of this. But one thing is really crystal clear here. I'm not really worried about the researches or the facilities itself. We have really prominent research in Europe. We have really skilled researchers. We have really modern equipment.
we have the best, we have the Ferrari, so to speak. The problem is that someone has locked the door to the garage where the Ferrari is. So this is not about research. This is not about funding synchrotrons or neutron facilities. This is about getting the industry engaged. And uh, it's, it's about business development and it's about some soft issues as well, like people, you know, people. So what we are doing now is we are trying to get this engagement from the industry, the people that are working in the industry, and this is not really easy. We have a lot of prominent researchers in the industry as well, and they used to work with the, the guys from uh, the academic side, and sometimes they do really good things, and we have heard some of them before, but we can do more. And uh, when it comes to engage the industry, I think you should learn your, not enemy, but yeah, you understand what I'm saying. Uh, we need to look into the value chain. We, we need to talk with values because in the industry, it's the money. So uh, when we look at the value, there is research value and we have uh, industry value that becomes business value. And uh, then we have this risky part that is called intrinsic value. And intrinsic value is not good. But the industry, we don't really understand. We cannot put figures on the value using the synchrotrons. So the intrinsic value becomes more existing. And this is not good, but we can make a change. And we do by this initiative and some more. We're trying to, to collaborate with, uh, for a start, the Swedish industry, and now I'm talking about the engineering and technology industry. We are really trying to sit in the front row and to drive and to really uh, specify and put some list that we could show to the infrastructures. This is what we would like to have from you, your side. And I think this is the most important result of this study this far, that the industry should be the driver. Because even though you have a lot of nice or really good uh, possibilities to do fantastic research using the facility, we cannot really find the value because in our value chain, using a research fac facility is just a tiny part. So if we can do a, a work around instead, that would be much better for the business. But if we are looking in the big picture, we need to understand that in the future we must use the research infrastructures. This might be a little bit provocative, but you're welcome. And, uh, but I think we all here, we would like to see something better in the future. So I think we can, if we work together, that's my takeaway. So thank you. Thank you very much. So now we go to with uh, Muriel, the views from RTOs. Thank you very much, Leah. So uh, happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation, uh, Rana. I think we are happy to see ourselves as a stakeholder of S3. Just a short view. Who knows EARTO? If you can just raise your hand, then I know what I have to explain or not. And now, who knows ERTEOs? Yeah, a little bit more work to do. And I think that's why I'm here. You know, if you don't have colleagues RTOs, probably um, you will see what Magnus is asking uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, ERTO is the association of 350 plus RTOs. RTOs stands for Research and Technology Organization. I see some more colleagues here from Helmholtz. I see also VTT, old colleagues of CEA. These are the type of organization I represent. 
and um, those organizations, so those research institutes which are um, looking at tech development, they have a part, uh, especially for the larger one, which are also doing fundamental research, if you're talking the example of the CEA, in particular areas, and often they have some of their research infrastructure which are labeled as free. Uh, and they have other directions which are very targeted to working with the industry, and they have technology infrastructure. That at least we, we make a kind of um, business model type uh, of um, categorization of infrastructure in our own institutes. Uh, the ones which are more targeted to, uh, let's say, lower TRL research and then having a direction who tries to pick that up and scale that up and develop tech, we call them tech infra. And what you see is that, at least as EARTO, we had a lot of discussion on, we were quite happy, our, our members generally are satisfied with S3, uh, they're quite active, they, they are, I think, like what Antoine is saying, can we have more funds? <laughs> but I don't know any part of the Horizon Europe program who doesn't ask for more funds, so I think uh, the guys working on technology infrastructure with the European partnerships will ask for more as well. Um, so the question for us is, as organization, how do we have a continuum of infrastructure that allows us to fulfill the missions and the public mission we have, which is to support the industry. Um, there is some of my members who even have a mission title, uh, support the GDP in Spain. Um, so it's, it's quite targeted to, um, to economic impact. And what you see is, I think that's what um, uh, Magnus is saying is that between the research infrastructure and the technology infrastructure, you have quite different of business model, also working with the industry, the type of services that are provided with the industry, the industry different type of skills, uh, different type of view on IPs, um, so quite a, a wide range of uh, variation, I think, in the way they are set up, but especially in the services they are providing. And... Um, I think, Magnus, you know very well the test best Sweden, and I think that's why partly you mentioned um, this has been very pushed by some of our members, saying um, there is some even of the infrastructure which are sitting in technical university that we um, need to link to our infrastructure, for example, as RTOs. So I think the challenge of the future will be how do we have a continuum which makes on infrastructure types which makes enough impact for what we uh, want to achieve. I think on our side we saw uh, good examples at European level on policy setting. Um, uh, with, for example, the EU CHIP Act. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion on where do we want to sit versus the US and China, what type of amount of money we have. I mean, the, the US is putting fresh money. We try to do the same amount of figure, but not with fresh money, so probably don't reach the same extent. But still, there is very much behind the discussion on the CHIP Act uh, what type of technology infrastructure and also research infrastructure do we need in the future, especially in terms of clean rooms, um, to be able to have the chips of the future um, as good as we have them now and to keep the industry in Europe. And what you see is that um, DG Connect already financed a big project called the Technology and um, um, no, the Testing and Experimenting Facility, the TEF, where you have now a big project for 150 million euros spending um, the carrots money for member states to put more funding on their technology infrastructure uh, for reaching that we are sure to have the uh, clean rooms we need for the microelectronic industry. And I think this is a thinking that you guys already had for the research infrastructure in S3 for big shots sometime. I think we didn't have that yet for the technology infrastructure. So we're actually learning from your way of doing. We probably don't do it the same way because we have to talk to industry. We have to have agreement of the industry also to go uh, for this type of infrastructure, being sure that they're going to use it. Um, but I think that has been a learning from S3 that uh, we took for the technology infrastructure on um, sometime you have to think big. And I hear also Antoine saying, yeah, we may be limited quite money for more. And I agree, already we have microelectronics. Guys are advanced also on hydrogen, I think, in the thinking. Um, now with the technology roadmaps um, in ERA, we are looking at textile construction and also circular economy. Um, there is more thinking to do, and I'm sure that 
Um, if my type of stakeholder will be much more linked even to S3, you will have exchanges on business model. I mean, I've been invited to S3 once, six years ago, to discuss innovation business model and to explain how RTOs were functioning. I've not received more invitation from S3. This is the first one today. So I think the door is here from our garage open. We also have Ferraris, and we are very happy to make a bigger garage together, if I have to take uh, <laughs> Magnus say. And I think there is... Um, capabilities and way of doing um, linking to industry that could be learned, and in the same time, probably more exchanges in type of infrastructure to create some continuum in certain key areas, especially those which will be picked up in the industrial strategy at EU level. So much more to do, and happy to do it jointly as well. Thank you, Muriel. Let's proceed with universities. So David, the view of science and technology universities. Thank you very much. Um, this is a great day, really, and I'm really happy to be here, and a huge thanks to you, Jana Esfri, for having us. Thank you, Leah, for having us here on this panel. Uh, Laurent, thank you, and uh, the Belgian delegation for hosting this first meetup with the Esfri stakeholders. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm David Bomert. I'm SecGen of an association that unites 57 research-intensive universities of science and technology in 27 countries in Europe and beyond. 40% are comprehensive universities with a strong S&T profile, the best innovative universities in Europe. Think of KU Leuven, for example. 60% uh, are specialized technical universities such as ETH, obviously the highest rank European university in the world, continental European university in the world. Um, I'd like to um, structure my intervention along three interactions, academics and academics institution and infrastructures. Um, that will be the main part. Then about academics and our sector with S3 and to finalize, and Anna introduced this idea to us, the sector with the EU institutions in the context of the ERA action number eight. Now, Muriel just asked you who knows the ARCO. I'm going to ask you who has been educated and trained at a university. Please raise your hands. <laughs> OK. Who has held or holds an employment contract with the university? Ladies and gentlemen, who has never been educated or trained, held or holds an employment contract with the university? Ladies and gentlemen, we are the backbone of research infrastructures and of S3. <laughs> our, academics, <laughs> our academics engage with infrastructures for research, for education and training, for innovation. We do not only do that for scientific purposes, we do that for technological purposes, closely collaborating with our dear friends from RTOs and from, from business and industry. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of services to society, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we have different roles, and Anna touched upon it. We are users, we are designers, we are evaluators, we are governors. You all raised your hand. So, so, you know, a multiplicity of roles here. And in this sense, we are your key ally when it comes to scientific and technological excellence as, you know, safeguarding this. Academic institutions equally engage in research infrastructures as co-hosts, as co-locators, partners in ecosystems, as co-funders, national nodes, and in this sense, form yet another important backbone of s projects and landmarks. It has been mentioned by Jana, it has been mentioned by the Czech presidency, and we are very supportive of your priority there, and of course, by um, Anna, the context has changed. The pressing challenges, notably climate change, loss of biodiversity, are of alarming nature. Uh, energy crisis, uh, cost of living, health pandemics, the geopolitical context around us, as well as the explosion of data and what we can actually do. And that really gives us some key challenges. I'd like to mention four. And as Leah asked me to be really concrete, I will be concrete, Leah, on how we could solve them. 
First, I think um, these challenges actually really force us to broaden the scope of the impact that we're looking at in research infrastructures. And the colleagues to my right have already mentioned here, uh, but, but contrary maybe to the picture of a Ferrari and a garage, I think if we really want to help tackle global challenges, we might look at a different type of impact than an, at a Ferrari. We're talking about twin transitions, digital. We're talking about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so I think one thing we would really be pleading for also in the S3 methodology is to broaden, let us say, the narrative that we had on having socioeconomic impact constantly in, terming, in terms of creating jobs and boosting economic growth, what you call financial value for businesses, to a broader picture, to a picture of environmental impact, social impact, societal impact, that was, was mentioned here. And we should not only do that in terms of science, because this is not anymore about the importance for research of infrastructure. This is about the importance of infrastructures to help tackle the big challenges of our times. So we must change the way we look at the impact of infrastructures, both in scientific as well in technological terms. I think we really need to walk away also from this idea of sector-oriented instruments and policies that we have done in the past towards a policy-oriented approach, and that forces all of us in this room, and it has been mentioned by my colleagues to the right, that we need to improve value chains. Value not only in terms of finances, in terms of nature, in terms of the quality of water, air, and all of that social, inspirational values. And if we want to do that, we need to increase the, 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 the cooperation patterns, notably in ecosystems. And I think this ecosystem approach, you mentioned it, Carlo, with regards to Ailey, we would say in Zurich. Um, so this ecosystems approach, bringing together a variety of partners from academia, from RTO, from the RPOs, from local governments and industry, business and industry, but also NGOs, that is really the focus of what we should do. Um, a very particular challenge is related to data and what we can do with data. And I think this, uh, we would really like to highlight the importance uh, of the transition to open science. Um, now, that means more and better engagement between infrastructures and EOSC. And uh, I'm somehow, I must say, surprised, Leah and Jana, to not find let us say Ute here on, on the panel, because obviously she, you know, she represents a really important sector um, in this sense. A third challenge I see is the need to align strategic prioritization and commitment in governance structures between partners involved. And I think, uh, Carlo, you have brought forward in your ERIC report quite an important topic there, the fact that many of the RTOs, many of the research performing organizations or universities that actually provide the national notes for distributed infrastructures basically are hidden in the decision making of the ERIC councils. And I think this is really something where I'm very grateful to you and I think I speak on behalf of all of us that we sort of, um, you know, can feed better into the decision making there. But it's also about um, how road mapping is done at the regional, national, and European level. So we need really a stronger link of the communities, whether they are RTOs, RPOs, universities, that feed together with local governments into national roadmaps. And we should actually think, and I think the Swedish model is here, still a wonderful model, we should think about what is this commitment and how can we make prioritization on the basis of strategic commitments of research institutes, RTOs, and universities alike. The last, of course, is always money. Um, sorry, I can't not talk about money. Sustainable funding is one thing. Um, coverage of costs, and Muriel already came up with it, you know, so access is one thing, services related to data, and so forth, and so forth. So we really need to think about coverage of the total costs. Um, Quite frankly, you know, the incompatibility of EU funds is still an issue. And again, we're really grateful to the Czech presidency there. And uh, uh, Leah, this is homework for you, because I think the European Commission 
for the first time in its history, should start designing programs in a way they create synergies up front before going to council and parliament uh, l rather than later. So um, the volume for research infrastructures under the EU framework programs for research and innovation is simply unacceptable. And you know, we have been saying that for a very long time. And so this is a call upon the people from the council in this room this must change, and I'll come back to some ideas uh, uh, on this. Um, so what can we do about it? So upfront design things with synergy, but I think, frankly, the biggest challenge that we as an academic community see is the gaps in the availability of national funding at crucial points in the life cycle of infrastructures. And I'm sorry, I, I sort of still have this hat in of the chair of the implementation group here, but I know from personal experience how painful this is to research infrastructures and the users are like to be confronted with this. Now, we have been talking, Carlo, many decades about European funding for infrastructures, and I think we have come to the point that we need to reflect about a bigger share of EU funding in infrastructures under the next framework program. And I think we should carefully think where we invest that money because I think this is about mitigating risks that we have experienced in so many projects and landmarks alike. This is about standardization. Why should the French government pay standardization in a disciplinary field? This is about critical infrastructure, transborder, cables, et cetera, where we always end up with who is responsible for that. And so it's actually about critical technology, also in the context of strategic autonomy and technological sovereignty that we need to address in a future program. So that was the long story. Now I'm going to be really short. Academics and uh, S3, our sector, we're really delighted to be here. We are very well organized, Leah, as you might know from the forum, so we are ready to help S3 in every of its work. We are really very much looking forward to the landscape analysis. We think you might want to change this a little bit into more foresighting, less people with interest in there. I think really engage also with the communities on the ground, RTOs, RPOs, to identify their related infrastructure. It was mentioned here. I think a link there is particularly the ask for all of us, right? Um, we are there to contribute to you in methodological terms. Uh, you will find our experts in your panels, in your board, and all of that. But I think as a sector, we're truly committed to help you with the landscape analysis and, and the methodology. Um, I reiterate that I think with the road mapping, and this is a call on the national governments, we know we cannot just follow a top-down approach in this. We need a bottom-up approach, inventory with the stakeholders on the ground, regional governments, national governments, into the European ones. And I understand national governments have national financing cycles and, and you know, election cycles, but hey, you know, Let's do our best, okay? Last but not least, the sector and the institutions concerning air action A. Hey, we're well organized, we're ready. My colleague is gonna follow here. Um, I think it has already become clear. If you look at air action, we need to take a differentiated approach. You delivered on Eric. Now we need to advance that and implement that. I think that's a certain trajectory. We would really like to be the stakeholder negotiating on the charter. Last we did, you know, in the revision, we are there to help when it comes to your methodologies. Let's see how this can happen, how far this co-creation is desired. I think when it comes to the EOSC, we have a perfect platform implementing that action line, and we should rather get them on board here rather than trying to do the work for them. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, David. Very concrete and clear messages. We'll come back to this. Benjamin. Yes, yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this, of this session. Um, 
I'm, I'm, as I'm the last speaker, so most of the things that, that I will say probably have already been said, especially after, after David's uh, intervention, with, with, which has been great. <laughs> uh, I will try to do my best. And, uh, and yes, I'm representing the Coimbra Group, which is a network of 40 universities uh, from all across Europe. And we and other uh, association, university associations that are representing in the ERA Forum, the, the university sector, we really welcome the intention to, to look beyond the traditional research infrastructure communities and also to the, the interest in, in raising awareness across the whole the whole research and, and innovation ecosystem, including universities. Uh, I total, totally agree with what David has just said about the, the importance of involving the, the universities in the S3 as one of the key uh, stakeholders. And I will try to complement his intervention by focusing a little bit on the on the role and the and the and the needs for, for comprehensive universities, and I'm touching just the very few things that he didn't say. Um, research infrastructures exist in a, a very large variety of forms and, uh, and structures, and we at the universities usually host uh, small and medium-sized uh, research infrastructures, virtual and also physical, that uh, most of the time uh, go and notice uh, outside the, the institutions them, themselves due to a lack of communication uh, or and coordination at, at local, uh, regional, national, and, and European level. We must avoid to uh, we must avoid that these big investments in in platforms in facilities uh, stays in the shadow uh, by improving the communication at all levels and with with all the stakeholders. Um, it is true that a lot a lot of progress has been made in the in the last years thanks in part to the ESRI uh, contributions to the coordination and also the implementation of a European roadmap. But but when it comes to communication, there, there is still a lot to a lot to be to be done and uh, and we think that the, the S3 is the perfect forum to 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 improve this um, we need we need a collaboration at, at the international level in order to to yes to to avoid the duplication of resources the efforts and also to avoid lack of critical mass to avoid a uh, high uh, high cost of operation, maintenance, and upgrade of the, of the existing infrastructure. So again, we are a key player, and we need to get involved in the policy and decision making, policy and decision -making uh, processes on this, on this topic. I would also like to, to stress the, the importance of, of um, interdisciplinarity. We always say that, that silos don't make for good science, not in terms of knowledge, not in terms of, of resources. Comprehensive universities such as the 40 that, that, that we at the Coimbra Group represent, uh, we are the entrance uh, to these research infrastructures for many, many interdisciplinary researchers. So interdisciplinarity is crucial to, to make sure that, that research infrastructures drive uh, research, technological development, and also, and also disruptive innovation. And for this to happen, we really need to have a strong science agenda established under uh, academic freedom and, and, uh, and uh, institutional autonomy. And for this, I think the DS3 is the perfect forum to contribute to, to this agenda, especially now in the context of, of the era. Um, I'm going to read this comment because I received it like a few minutes ago from one of, of our colleagues. So yes, more attention should be also placed to, on, on fostering university, university engagement in the, in the EOSC. Uh, as, as a um, knowledge provider institutions and also research performing organizations, uh, the universities are key facilitators and also beneficiaries of, of the, of the um, of the, the EOSC rollout. So while universities are large, largely aware of, of these benef benefits, uh, we, the universities, are still deciding whether to link the infrastructures to the, to the EOSC ecosystem. So again, regional, national, and European support is needed uh, to address university needs and also concerns around this. Then this was already mentioned by Anna Paganopoulou at the beginning of the of the session today, uh, but the relevance of, of basic uh, and fundamental research with the universities and also the research infrastructures belong together. Research infrastructures are a prerequisite uh, for the performance of high quality uh, research. Uh, by, provi by, by providing high quality uh, facilities, uh, services to 
researchers, to companies, to businesses. Uh, we make sure that, that, that these facilities uh, drive uh, science uh, uh, by, by excellence. And on the other hand, at universities, we generate basic and fundamental research that identifies early opportunities and also, and also future needs in science that will lead to disruptive innovation. So in this context of reciprocity, we really think that, that research infrastructures and universities go hand by hand. When, when, this is the hot topic of the, of the morning, but when speaking about research, uh, basic research, we cannot forget about the importance of social sciences and humanities, uh, which should be integrated in all the research and innovation strategies and, and agendas. It is nece still necessary for humanities to, 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 have and, to have access and to build fit for purpose uh, humanities research infrastructures given the nature of, of their research methods and also uh, working practices and data sets. A lot has been done in the last years uh, on behalf of the, I mean, I mean in favor of, of the SSH, but uh, these disciplines are still the least re represented among the, among the research infrastructure ecosystem uh, or, land, or landscape. So, and the last topic that I would like to, to highlight today is the importance the, of the connection between research infrastructures and also uh, the, the fundamental purpose of universities, which is education. Both undergraduate and graduate uh, trainings uh, benefit from, from the existence of research infrastructures. So, for example, our students uh, can apply the learnings, the, the theories that they have learned in the, in, in the courses they are enrolled in uh, through these facilities. They can also uh, use these facilities to, to create, to develop uh, prototypes and also to, to, yes, to, to test new, technolog new technological solutions. And on the other way around, uh, uh, the knowledge developed through these facilities also fits into the curricula at all levels. So, so universities are not only a, a, the trainer of the future uh, developers of these facilities, but are also the main users of the knowledge and also and the tools that has been created that have been created through the through them through these facilities. So to conclude, we can say that research infrastructures and universities uh, share the same mission covering the whole knowledge uh, square, which is research, innovation, education, and ser service to societies. And as she commented before. Uh, higher education institutions are also a real pool of talent for research infrastructure, so we need to go high, hand by hand. We need, to, we need to continue to be a key player in the S3 stakeholder forum, and we are, we are, we are ready to, to engage more. Thank you very much for your, uh, all your interventions. Um, it, there are many participants to this panel, but I think there, are many, there is a lot of value in actually addressing all the different angles. Um, and, uh, well, there are also limitations on how many people we could invite just to, to reply to one of the remarks, uh, but we take note of all the suggestions that have been made. I wanted to pick up on a few points that you raised uh, very briefly in order to also have the opportunity to take some comments from the floor. Uh, maybe I can regroup some points. I would like to start with the issue of the ERICs. Uh, going back to Paco, you, were, you, you briefly mentioned on the VAT. Uh, from your experience, how does the ERIC status uh, make a difference in the engagement with stakeholders? Would you like to comment a little bit more on this? Sure. Well, actually, this is, um, uh, I mean, what makes uh, the, the research infrastructures at ERICs uh, different. Of course, one of the things very clear is that it is a legal entity, right? I mean, and it has a lot of, of potential in that sense, and it uh, engages with the governments and engages with the commission. At, at that uh, very special level. I think it is very important also because if we talk about um, uh, how we work together in creating these research infrastructures, it is quite clear that uh, the challenges that we have ahead cannot be solved by any country uh, alone. Therefore, we get together into these uh, uh, joint undertakings, into these uh, research infrastructures. This could be uh, especially important, and it was mentioned by Carlo in his report, to the, to the small countries. But actually, I remember here a quote from, a, I think it was a Danish minister who said, we are in a small country, and these others do not know they are in a small country. Okay? Because actually what happens is that in the global context, all of our countries are quite small. So we better... Uh, 
work together at European level in that sense, and I think uh, Eric's are a fantastic uh, solution in, uh, for, for the uh, exact uh, um, infrastructures. Now, uh, we have a special challenge, I think, that it is the fact that still we think too much nationally. Uh, many of the uh, aspects that are uh, for the success of the ERICs, for the engagement of the, of the countries, is the national research communities. And the national research communities, for some specific fields, may not be too large, but still, Working together is what makes these infrastructures valuable, and that means that also we must recognize that the research community or the users community, it is global. It is not necessarily linked to each one of the countries in particular. And that now, uh, uh, because it has been mentioned, and I think it's also very uh, specific for the ERICs, uh, that is the, the, the fact that uh, our Research infrastructures are repositories of knowledge, right? And that means that we have had a very interesting discussion in the, in the, in the past uh, times about the skills and competences, and they have been also mentioned by Magnus today. I mean, it, is, uh, it starts at the universities, but then it continues, and it, it continues a lot in research infrastructures. So we have really, uh, n well, an opportunity, a mandate, and a challenge to, uh, to make possible that the people who work at research infrastructures have the, uh, I mean, they are attractive, and they are attracted by it. And, and one of the challenges that we have also identified are the, the European, uh, the possibility of having European contracts for the people who work at research infrastructure so that these are uh, actually, uh, as we say, more attractive to that. Well, there, there, there are so many things, right? We don't have time for, for, to list all of them, but I think one of the points is uh, how specifically the role of ERICs uh, as legal entities, uh, as ensuring sustainability for the infrastructure, good engagement of the stakeholders, in particular the governments, the commission, the users, creating good atmosphere for the people who work there, developing the skills and competences that are necessary. And last but not least, the uh, potential uh, for communication, uh, uh, societal impact, right? How we communicate to the society and they understand that what happens in, in the research infrastructures is an, inf is an investment. And that could also be sent to Magnus and, and their industries. I mean, well, because what we do here is that we invest together. I mean, the, the industry is being attracted uh, to the research infrastructures, and I think we have been doing uh, a, a lot of, uh, I think the Commission has been helping here, eh? telling the research infrastructures that we have to engage with uh, industry, but it's also from the industry point to understand the concept of, of uh, investing with the help of the research infrastructures, okay? And I think this is something that maybe in other areas of the world is more clear, and in Europe we are still struggling uh, to find the, the proper way to do that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to comment on how we can improve links with industry and the value chains? Because this has been addressed. Uh, Muriel, you mentioned it from the point of view of RTOs. David, also from the point of view of S&T universities, research intensive universities. Magnus, you uh, used a metaphor which I think will be remembered from this, uh, from this panel. So how, how can we actually uh, work in practice to make sure that we actually contribute? In addition, of course, to the fundamental missions of research infrastructures, how do we expand towards industry in a concrete way? So, so I wanted to pick up on something Magnus said anyway, and Magnus, I think you'll, un, you'll recognize the engagement model of 20 years ago between synchrotrons, or sorry, research infrastructure and industry was really not to engage other than in a very transactional fashion. You know, we'd say, here's a synchrotron, would you like to use it? And I think what has changed is that when we design these research infrastructures and when we operate them, actually first what we do and we should do is we go to industry and say, what are your problems? what kind of research infrastructure is most useful to you. And that is now incorporated into the design of the infrastructure and the way we operate. Um, in general terms, you want answers to solutions rather than just data. Um, and that's actually completely transformed our operating model in a way that's spilled over into the university access. So when I talked about less expert user engagement, the way in which we engaged with industry which needed a different kind of support which didn't rely on experts from your companies coming to use this, but wanted solutions to problems, actually that has also uh, given great benefits to diversifying the way in which we engage with the, the broader research community as a whole. So I think a key thing is engagement with, with industry who, who have a right from the start to design the RIs and the operations that we, um, uh, that we support. Okay. 
try this again. It works. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I know that uh, I've been visiting your site, and uh, I mean, what I'm saying is not pointing fingers. I say that you are on the right track. You do the right thing, and the industry is another word. We, we need to do the homework as well, because all the investments we have done in the past, we don't see see the scale of it. And, and that is not only your fault, so to speak. It's also the industry. We, we need to work in another way. We are in the need of a full working ecosystem, including things that in some way it's we are supposing that the infrastructures should develop some functionalities but maybe that's wrong because maybe the infrastructures should focus on their parts and there are other parts in the ecosystem that the industry needs to take ownership of and that discussion is not really open because we have we have a, the need of yeah, powerful computers and storage that is not really uh, x-ray scientists work we have uh, IP co collaborations we have uh, secure uh, capabilities quality assurance uh, L, uh, service level agreements etc 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 buses hotel restaurants and, so, and that part this is not topics for the academic research. This is topics for the industry. So what I'm saying is that we both need to do our homework. But I'm, as I said before, I'm not really worried about the synchrotron or the neutron facility sites because I know that what you have been developing and what you can use today is really, really fantastic. It's top notch. But it's the other part that is missing. So no offense. Thank you. Maybe just another point, uh, Antoine, you touched on the energy costs. I think it's really on the top of the agenda. Heavily discussed at the parliament yesterday, among other points. Um, would you like to say a few things more? And also, David, you touched on the digital aspects uh, also. Would you like to say a few words about uh, how you see the role of the stakeholders for the greening of infrastructures or for the digital transition for that matter? Yes, to, to be precise, I didn't ask for more money. I just said it will cost more. So, no, it's not the same. It means that if we don't have more money, it, mean, it will mean that we'll as responsible of uh, RIs will have to make choices, either inside the reforced infrastructures programs or to do cuts in other programs. There is no free lunch. Uh, and that is it's, it's something new. And we have all to, to face this problem. And it's uh, the amount of money which is uh, is very important. Well, co concerning greenings of RI, uh, and more generally, perhaps, greening of science, I think that first of all, we have to admit that uh, doing science can be climate unfriendly. Clearly. But we also know that it is a scientist, in particular, thanks to the remarkable work of the IPCC, who have first sounded the alarm in climate change. So it is therefore, I think, up to us, up to the scientific community, to find the right balance between the indispensable progress of knowledge and also the safeguarding of the planet. And no one, or I think no, no reasonable person, can think that uh, stopping scientific activities or giving up research infrastructures is the right solution. But I think like, like everyone else, scientists, we must have the ambition to reduce our carbon footprint. And, but yet, how harsh scientific activities are on the Earth's carbon footprint is still uncertain. And uh, I think we, we should need to start uh, to measure this carbon footprint. Uh, and I think that we have to do it in an effective and scientific way and to not be overwhelmed by emotions like most of the people. And I think we need a common tool for quantifying 
carbon footprints, because everyone nowadays has their own model with significant biases from one institution to another. And I think as scientists, in some sense to set the good example, we need to have a rational global approach that is shared by as many, if possible, uh, everybody uh, to, to measure this footprint. And there are initiatives uh, on which we, we can, uh, we can uh, construct such a, a model. I will not enter in details, but we have in France uh, a collective called Labo 1.5, Labs 1.5, and they have a, a website, uh, and they propose uh, tools to measure uh, the footprint at the level of a, of a lab, which is not the appropriate uh, level to, today. But uh, I think we, we should really need to have, at least as European label, a, gl a global comparable approach, uh, adapt, of course, to research infrastructures, and without, of course, forgetting uh, the, the data centers. Uh, and so I really push the, uh, to the idea that we, we should have a scientific approach to this question. And uh, we, we, once again, we, we, we have to, to, to give the, the right example to people. If, if I look, for instance, for salaries, people can say, oh, hey, OK, you, we have to reduce emissions and, and, and so on. And the, OK, and so we measure it. It's only 13% of our carbon uh, footprint. And this means that, for instance, infrastructure, as we said, it's, it's, it's the, footprint, uh, the carbon footprint is much higher. But we have, once again, to, to measure it precisely and to, to approach a scientific uh, method from my point of view. Thank you. Maybe I, uh, yes, I think Muriel, um, a brief, uh, brief comment, and then I would like to open the floor for any comments. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Wanted to, to come back with the relation to the industry and the fact that we are discussing ecosystems. Um, I hear a lot, and I read, for example, the draft in conclusion on the research infrastructure, and when you read the text, it means the ERI do everything and all. Um, discussion with the industrial policy, um, discussion with the partnerships, discussion with the missions, discussion with X, Y, Z, with scientific equipment, etc., etc. Sometimes the bar maybe is placed so high um, that the clear targets are too many and maybe um, too forefront. I remember uh, discussing um, the Charter of Access, and there was with you, David, and I remember Anika. And um, I had very strong reaction on the other side when I said, yeah, but there is no article on market access. We are just running with market access to our infrastructure for RTOs. And that was a cultural shock at the time. Uh, and that was not that long ago. So if you are um, honest sometime, there is some of the Eric and Eric that are working, of course, with the industry and some of the Eric, of course, but you have other stakeholders, and I think the RTOs with their tech infra are more advanced in this type of business model that you could use as translator. Um, I think that's even a question within the large RTOs who have uh, S3 uh, type of infrastructure and the more technology infrastructures, that they even explain the different directions they have inside that they can learn from each other uh, in terms of different business models and trying to even create within the organization this ecosystem of exchange. So, I know it's sometimes difficult at an RTO level when you are very large, 20,000 plus researchers. So I imagine it's the same in smaller ecosystems. Um, and I think here maybe you need to look for um, who can you improve this type of focus system. So you had the board discussion of the Seric and Eric to have the guys, uh, you know, from the other label stakeholders more present. But maybe here it's a little bit of thinking on how you could use that. Um, why I say this, in, um, in Sweden, the test-based um, strategy, for example, uh, give example of some of the technology infrastructure to give you the difference of business model compared to the S3 ones. Um, the TU puts money, the RTO puts money on the table, the structure of funds puts money for the ground, but what makes the bring money, and that was for an infrastructure for uh, next to the Volvo, made by RISE and by the TU of Chalmers, is the guarantee of use by the industry for 12 to 15 years of the future infra. This is thinking so far uh, before then you have the research infrastructure and then try to connect to the uh, industry. 
Um, even those business models in RTO are not um, main spread. We don't take loans very easily. Um, so imagine that even the RTOs, which are quite advanced in different business models, working with their tech infra, with industry, are testing different um, new business models, and it's not that easy. I think you guys could use this type of connections in your different ecosystem to really push the envelopes uh, and maybe not try to do it all yourself. Um, that's a little bit what I hear. And a warning, you can have very high expectation, but you fall very low. So I say, shoot somewhere in the middle and have your partners working with you. And I think that's why we sit here today. Thank you. Um, so I, um, I think I would like to ask, to ask you for comments from the floor uh, to the panelists or questions to the panelists or any comments uh, Regarding the, trans the discussion, yes, please, uh, please mention your affiliation and name. Philippe Sigers from Price, the HPC uh, European agency so far. Uh, so if, if we look back uh, 30 years ago and uh, we would have the same panel, I think uh, w what would have changed is that uh, uh, people were uh, wearing ties and uh, smoking cigarettes, <laughs> but uh, there is still uh, not uh, as many uh, women on the panel as we would like, uh, as we would expect yes. in uh, 2022. So uh, that's for uh, an important part of our stakeholders. Uh, one of the things that are the m most important for us is people, 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 uh, twin people. And we could not afford to, to, to provide such an uh, image. Uh, Yana knows that uh, uh, some months ago, we, we managed to have a stakeholder forum uh, for the EuroHPC uh, Summit Week uh, with uh, 16 people, and half of them were women. So when there is a will, there is a way. Uh, in these uh, things for, like for others. Um, also, to, to, to get back to uh, what uh, um, uh, Antoine uh, said about uh, energy. Uh, yes, this is very, uh, very important. Uh, this is also why at the uh, CNRS, uh, Idris, uh, Gen C, uh, supercomputers, uh, we use some of the energy uh, that we consume to eat uh, the, the Sac Plateau Saclay. So uh, I think that there is also a uh, way uh, that science could, uh, could help. But still, yes, we, we have to be more. Uh, aware of what, uh, what we are doing. And uh, also to say that uh, high performance computing, in high performance computing there is high performance, and this is always our goal to have uh, the more energy efficient system. And uh, it is also something that have to be seen in a global way. This is always more efficient to do some computation in a supercomputer, in a high performance computer, than to do that in smaller systems where we lose more energy. Uh, but to, to get back to more uh, to other important topics, uh, to, with regard to uh, how to engage stakeholders, at Price we have uh, we are doing a lot of work to engage uh, the industry. Uh, we have a program for uh, helping SMEs to engage with the HPC. And uh, one of the things that is very difficult uh, for us to, 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 to explain to uh, this uh, industry and to this SME is to explain the roadmap. What is the roadmap uh, of Europe? who are the stakeholders, and uh, each, each time I try to explain uh, how it works, uh, how are these different agencies, uh, the different uh, guichet, uh, where to start with, I think it's complicated. And uh, also, when we started Press uh, 10 years ago, I must say that uh, the roadmap and uh, uh, the paysage was uh, more, uh, more easy. To understand. Now, there is a lot of initiative, uh, a lot of good initiative uh, from uh, European Commission, swear, but uh, honestly, it's being a nightmare to understand uh, for uh, an industry point of view uh, where, where to start, uh, where to go on Fed project, on uh, uh, so, so many initiatives I could, not, I could not tell. And so I think that there is a, a very uh, strong need to, to, to provide a more clear vision and to help uh, uh, especially the industry but also the researcher to know how to start with and, and to help them uh, to understand uh, and try also not, not to uh, 
to uh, too many uh, initiatives uh, that end up with the silos that does not work together. And, and we are not always going in the right direction for that. Clear message. Um, I would, yes, please, there in the middle. Um, Margherita Cappelletto from National Research Council Italy, representing the Sustainable Blue Economy Partnership. Um, we are a pan-European initiative with a strong uh, um, regional component, meaning uh, all the sea basins and the Atlantic Ocean are really part uh, of the uh, strategy. Um, we have heard about uh, the um, impact that uh, a physical facility can have in, uh, in a territory. Uh, we have heard about the need to engage with stakeholders. Thanks to Benjamin, we also heard about the uh, importance for the training. Maybe it's an implicit uh, word, maybe it's an old-fashioned one, but I think that research infrastructure are really hubs for developing capacity. And uh, from the sea basin perspective, we, you uh, are really confronting European uh, dimension with the international dimension, because you are collaborating with non-European countries. Uh, I think that this aspect of the capacity development can really play a big, big role in developing innovation uh, at local level, and so impact at local level. So maybe it's very clear to all of you, but uh, from our perspective, and considering that typology of ocean facilities, this is really important, I guess. Thank you. Let's take a few more comments, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, also from the uh, National uh, Research Council of Italy, Emiliano degli Innocenti, and representing Daria IT, which is one of the infrastructures uh, dealing with the social sciences and humanities. Um, one thing that has changed for sure during the last years is that our domain is becoming more and more impacted by the digital uh, technologies. So we are building lots of uh, digital facilities. We are implementing data centers uh, all over the country in Italy, but uh, we are facing at least the three level of uh, uh, challenges. One is cultural, because we have to communicate to our colleagues uh, what is for real uh, research infrastructure, because they could have um, a, an idea, but uh, now we should be able to provide them facts. Uh, what is our uh, added value as an infrastructure for your uh, research uh, on a daily basis? And this is the first challenge we have. The second challenge we have is sustainability. Because if we will not be able to improve our impact on society and on our research community, the fact that uh, um, the energy is costing more and more, the fact that we started to build big facilities and we cannot stop because we are investing on a national basis on such kind of uh, improvement of our ICT backbones. So we need to make this sustainable, because otherwise we will be ending with two failures. One, stopping the already going on projects. Two, uh, ending up uh, with uh, um, half-built facilities with uh, no consolidated user base. And the third uh, level of challenge that uh, we face, at least in my opinion, is to be more and more open to the uh, traditional hard sciences, because we already have uh, conversations going on and collaborations going on. But it's still hard to have two segments of uh, infrastructures related to SSH and, for example, uh, don't know, physics or uh, another um, natural or applied science, uh, talking to each other in terms of uh, exchanging data uh, yeah. or interacting services. And this could be an enormous boost in value for the research infrastructures because uh, you can uh, change the scale 
if you can produce one resource uh, in uh, the humanities and uh, reuse this kind of resource in uh, economic studies, uh, in uh, physics, or w um, whatever you want to use it, this will be a tremendous added value for, um, for research infrastructures. And then uh, to really open up our services, our know-how, our products to the market. And here you have to work really, really hard because you have uh, uh, several challenges to, 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 to resolve. And uh, mm, we are still trying to do so, but uh, we have not reached yet um, all the solutions we need in order to make it this work. Thank you. Um, I think the lady here in the middle and then Carlo. Thank you. Um, Alexia Katsanidou, um, Gezes Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences, uh, but also SESTA and also MEDEM and so on. But most importantly, I am an active researcher in political science. And um, I would like to refer to one stakeholder that uh, has not been um, mentioned at all. And you will not be surprised to know that from my research on the impact on crisis on, uh, on public opinion, um, I know that trust in science has been dropping, and the average person, the most important stakeholder, the taxpayer, is reducing his or her trust in science. And that is connected, of course, with many other antis in life, anti-establishment, um, anti-trust, anti-European, uh, and so on. So now the question to all of us here is, what can we do as research infrastructures, as um, researchers, as universities and so on, as stakeholders in this big important element to not only increase trust, but actually to connect the work that we are doing uh, to the products that actually uh, everybody uses every day, but they cannot connect it back to the source. So everybody uses GPS, everybody uses the internet, but they don't think, they don't consider that this is actually the product of fundamental research and uh, the important infrastructures. So here's the question, how can we as stakeholders find as a core objective to make this connection in the minds of everybody? How can we connect to the average individual? How can we connect to the media or even to political parties? who uh, do this representation work um, and make sure that the funding continues to flow because this is about uh, that important component and that um, uh, fund fundamentals of our democracy, so research is a fundamental component of our democracy, would continue to thrive. Carlo, um, please. I take this one, it was nearer. So uh, one point is uh, that we are always facing with uh, the research infrastructures and research in general is what is the narrative that we can use to explain to everybody what we are doing. Now, uh, the uh, uh, reference, uh, sorry she has left, but uh, you had made it first, the reference to the Ferrari in the garage, I think is a very important reference. Uh, research infrastructures of all kinds, social sciences or physics or, or whatever, they have to be Ferraris. They must be Ferraris. The problem is that from time to time, you, in the interaction with people and with industry, you have somebody that comes and you say, this is a Ferrari, is 600 horsepower, and goes very fast. And the other one says, 600 horsepower, yes, my trucks are 600 horsepower. Let's see how many goods you can bring with the Ferrari. <laughs> or, and then I reply normally, well, if you want to beat a Formula One uh, race uh, with a truck, welcome, you can do it. The horsepowers are the same, after all. So you can go, or the cost is the same. So the problem is that, uh, of course, there is a, another element, which is competition at the international level. From this competition, which is brought to the limits in most cases, the Ferrari is able to build up a story, build up a, a narrative, and build up competences that are then drawn in a number of industries, from the brakes to the fiat,
to the uh, uh, airplanes and so on, which are the competences that are the value. So the, they are uh, uh, improving value chains in a number of places. And this is exactly what we are doing with the research infrastructures. Because we are competing at world level, we are producing values which too often are forgotten and are not described in the right way. So we have really to try to improve in the way in which the values of the research infrastructures can be brought to the general societal value chain, which is uh, normally the bottleneck that we have. And here there is a problem of education which, and training, which is normally lacking. In most cases, in research infrastructures, the uh, staff is too thin. Uh, everybody is uh, subjected to short time, to, uh, uh, to, to not to have enough time, and there is not enough input of people that uh, develop the right uh, narrative together with other parts of society in such a way that we are able to bring the narrative forward. So I think that uh, this is the bottleneck that we are facing now. Also because the requirements are different. So the narrative before was towards the users, you get a Ferrari and you know how to use it. Now we have a Ferrari, but we have to try to understand how the users, the possible secondary, call them users, are using the knowledge and the values that we produce with these Ferraris. And this is, uh, uh, a problem of, of staff and people. We have really to increase the number of people that are able to bridge. And here, social science is very, very useful because the narrative, they develop narratives. So this is the point in which, for example, physics is not very good. So optimization of use, expansion of user base, and education and training, among other things. I already took the microphone. Thank you yes. very much. I'm Ute Gunzenheim. I'm the Secretary General of the ESC Association. And thanks, David, for mentioning us. Um, I would like to offer our collaboration to S3 because 17 of the um, infrastructures listed on the roadmap are already members in the EOSC Association. We have 240 members representing the research performers and the service providers. And we have a partnership with you, the European Commission. And there the member states play an important role in our tripartite governance. And we are now going on a roadshow through Europe, having so-called national tripartite events. And I really invite you to come and join us there and work towards, I mean, working towards the different era objectives because we are there in the same boat with the same objectives. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we will have the opportunity to discuss about s 3 eos cooperation in the coming uh, period, uh, for sure. It's uh, on the top of the agenda. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel Wieselke, again from Austria Research Ministry. Uh, EOSC was started in the, under the Austrian presidency, and this is, is a big success uh, and a, a, big, um, ex a big asset for the future, so one cannot uh, uh, talk enough about this thing, and thanks, uh, David, for mentioning, and I see, I'm sure we will uh, have um, more successful. But I would support, very much support Carlo in what saying that the physicists were not so... Uh, good in, in narratives. Uh, they, they, saw, they talked about the Higgs boson and thought this is enough. In everyday life, the Higgs boson has no impact on all. So there is much more behind, uh, and this is, should be the narrative. What is this technology uh, or this, um, uh, this, this, this knowledge good for the people in everyday life? Because it's paid by taxpayers. We should come back again that all these research infrastructures are not paid by themselves, it's paid by the European taxpayers. Um, uh, so we have to develop these narratives much, much further, and we should step down from the high-level scientific explanation what they are doing, explaining the universe, because most of that is not understood by, by ordinary people. And here is a big, big, big gap uh, to overcome. I, I saw that every we have the Children University, and I'm here engaged, and we see how important it is to have a, a narrative which is by far 
reaching out much more wider than just the scientific. So important it is, clearly, but it's not enough. And the other thing is, I would come back on the um, energy price and uh, on these things because it was mentioned several times, but um, this is now a very crucial question. All the European people were asked by the European Commission to save energy. So all these um, uh, European uh, energy intensive research infrastructures uh, have here a, a very important task to show, not only to come to the taxpayers and ask for more money to pay for their energy uh, bill, but to show how they are also saving energy. So until now, I did not see any engagement in, in, in that direction, but I'm sure it will come. And for example, ESO, the European Southern Observatory, put uh, a very good example as they are having a greening their uh, energy in, in Chile by putting a solar plant which provides all the energy for the observatories there. Of course, it's different in, 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 in Europe than in Chile, but there is a, a much room for improvement in this greening exercise and especially in the energy intensive uh, research infrastructure. So um, Austria put in one of these uh, infrastructures the question how to, uh, in, in Geneva, the one uh, we want, uh, there is a big uh, uh, energy bill and we, we asked in the council for a, a change in, in, in things and we are not very much supported, but I think that this support will come and will be necessary and will have to be uh, also um, talked and, uh, to, the, to the taxpayers who, who pay the bill. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. I see uh, two remaining hands, so I will give the floor for two additional comments and then we will have to break because we only have one hour before the beginning of the parallel sessions. So first here in front, uh, Giorgio, and then uh, please. Thank you. Um, I think there are uh, living models that follow the evolution of the user need, the uh, approach of users to the uh, research infrastructures that go in the direction of helping to address research programs, not just individual measurement steps or individual um, access activities to a specific resource. And these are, uh, uh, let's say, transversal uh, models, because in order to provide these research infrastructure services, complex services, you have to rely on resources from the research performing organizations, research, resources from and competencies from universities, as well as resources and competencies from the large scale facilities, let's say. Um, uh, referring in particular to uh, nano uh, science, material mm. science, uh, um, because that's my more, uh, most direct uh, experience. And uh, uh, just to make an example, uh, there is an infrastructure that is offering over 200 methods for nano science, going from synthesis of the sample all the way through theory, fine analysis, characterization, uh, with over 650 instruments. Now, you need an organization to run that, and that's a technical liaison, a technical liaison among large-scale facilities, university laboratories, uh, research performing organization, is a big value because it transfers knowledge among all the participants, who is doing well what, who is needing to upgrade what resource, and builds indeed an um, ecosystem, if you like to use this uh, word, uh, an efficient uh, organization that uh, is also ideal to implement fair data technologies and to diffuse it at the levels of the large scale facilities, of the uh, research performing organization, and of the uh, universities, and of course, through the users to their home um, universities. So um, I think 
this is a dimension that is important to capture in the, in the landscape of Esprit or all uh, these uh, exercises uh, because it's key for the uh, interoperability. Interoperability, we use that word for data, but interoperability is for laboratories. You have a user, a scientist who has a project that needs expertise and tools at one location and then other expertise and other tools in another location, he must be able to move from one to the other with its sample, maybe in ultra vacuum, with the data acquisition systems that are compatible and build up a, a research program that relies on the best, the most prominent resources that are relevant for his study, that can be the large facility for some aspects, or can be the top gun single university laboratories. So I believe that this is a model that exists and that can grow and that should be recognized and maybe should even be uh, labeled somehow as a European uh, organization and that can involve deeply the universities. I trust that more, so university laboratories participating to a European association for delivering some services than considering the universities themselves as <coughs> research infrastructures. They, they could be, but they are full of university professors, so we know that <laughs> <laughs> it's not national, regional, it's departmental is the floor of the, <laughs> of the department that sometimes creates uh, the barrier. So um, let's keep an eye on this model uh, that is populating some relevant aspects in the landscape and that involves industry as well. We had the surprise to open a call for industrial partners and we had over 20 applications. So industry is interested to be an insider of a, a research infrastructure organization and even to offer access in their to their methods in an environment, in an industrial environment. So it was explained to us, uh, we, we have analytical tools. Maybe they're not as competitive as yours, but they are in the industrial environment. And this can be an added value for some users. So there are glues that can be uh, steered and, and employed to, to improve the research infrastructure action. Thank you. One very last brief statement, please, so that we can break. I'll try to make it brief by not speaking too fast, which is normally what I do. Uh, I'm Katherine Angel Hansen. I work for the Norwegian Research Council, but uh, in this context with Margarita in the Sustainable Blue Economy Partnership. My quick first comment is we have a major stakeholder who's not here, and that is uh, the policy makers. Governance. Uh, we live in a knowledge economy, and governance is providing framework conditions for, amongst other, the industry. And they need stability. They often invest in a 20 to 30 years perspective. So I think in the engagement on how uh, we need to inform and ensure that we're maximizing the impacts of the infrastructures, we also need to take them into account. And then from the Sustainable Blue Economy Partnership perspective, uh, we have a specific challenge which we really think about, and that is the fact that uh, we're planning without seeing what we're planning for, because we have simply not cracked the code for communication in the, of, uh, in the oceans, in the sea. Or to put it the way ESA, European Space Agency said, your challenges is as complex, it's dark, it's dense, high pressures, but in addition you have to take into account the biology. Uh, I raise that issue because uh, today member states and associate countries spend 2 billion euros annually on research, of which 1.2 billion is used to generate data to support science for policy making and the industry. And this is excluding industry money. So since we're now moving into sessions in different groups with oceans and so on, our key uh, element is what can we learn from others? 
what can we learn from the health sector, etc. So uh, let's not forget that dimension also, uh, because uh, we are often a little bit in our own world. Yes, thank you very much, and, and uh, I'm sure we will have the opportunity to discuss these points also in the OCEAN's parallel session that follows after the lunch break. Very good point on the users. This was raised also by the panelists, and uh, I think we have a lot of homework for David's panel on the methodology, because we heard a lot about the needs. Unfortunately, no time to recap, but now we have to come back and see how do we do this in practice. How do we engage with users so as to address societal challenges in a, in a meaningful way and expand the use? Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you very much for your at, uh, attention. And now we can break for lunch and we resume at a quarter past one for the parallel sessions. Thank you. Thank you.